So this lecture is part of an online graduate course on commutative algebra and will be about Dedekind domains. So I will start with an example. So the standard example of something that is not a unique factorization domain is z of root minus 5. So this consists of all integers, all numbers in the form m plus n root minus 5 with m and n integers. And an example of an unique factorization is 2 times 3 is equal to 1 plus root minus 5 times 1 minus root minus 5. And these are irreducible and these are irreducible and they're not units times each other. So this is two completely different factorizations of 6. And Kummer found a way of fixing this using ideals. Well, um, that's actually not true. Kummer didn't use ideals. He used something a little bit different called ideal elements. And ideals were only introduced later. But I'm going to ignore this and pretend that ideals were invented by Kummer. So in terms of ideals, you can factor the ideal two as a product of two ideals like this. And similarly, you can factor 3 as a product of two ideals. And you can also factor these two ideals here in a similar way. So you can check 1 plus root minus 5 is just equal to 2 1 plus root minus 5 times 3 1 plus root minus 5. And finally, 1 minus root minus 5 factors in pretty much the same way. Um, and now, if you call these ideals, let's call them, call this one A and call this one B and call this one C and this one D, then you find um, that AB times CD is equal to um, um, AC times BD. And this corresponds to the factorization 2 times 3 is 1 plus root minus 5 times 1 minus root minus 5. And although this factorization isn't unique, you can see in terms of ideals it is unique up to order. It's just saying ABCD is equal to ACBD. Um, so what Kummer showed is that every non zero ideal is a product of primes. When I say prime, I mean prime ideals in a unique way. Unique way means unique up to order, of course. Um, and this condition here is more or less the definition of a Dedekind domain. Um, actually, this isn't usually used as the definition of a Dedekind domain because it's a little bit difficult to work with. It's, it's not terribly obvious. Um, whether or not a ring satisfies this condition. Um, so uh, people usually use a slightly different definition of a Dedekind domain. Um, this condition for integral domains turns out to be equivalent to the union of the following three conditions. First of all, the ring is Noetherian. And secondly, um, every non-zero prime is maximal. And thirdly, it's integrally closed. So you remember integrally closed means you take the ring, embed it into its quotient field of quotients k, and every element of k that's integral over r, in other words, satisfies an equation of the form x to the n plus r n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus r0, is already in R. Um, I should say, you being dead, a Dedekind domain is equivalent to, um, th these are three separate conditions and they all have to hold. So, so these conditions certainly aren't equivalent or anything like that. Um, there are two standard ways of getting examples of Dedekind domains. Um, the first, is the integers of an algebraic number field. 
So a typical, typical examples of these are first of all, the integers themselves form a Dedekind domain. They're just the integers of Q. Um, and we, the example we just had, the integers of z root minus five. So you can think of this as being z x modulo x squared plus five. And this is, this is the algebraic, this is the integral closure of z in the ring q of root, in the field q of root minus five. Um, uh, another standard example are the coordinate rings of affine algebraic curves. A typical example of this might be just the ring of polynomials over, over a field. That's the coordinate ring of the affine line. Um, another example might be the um, coordinate ring of, say, an elliptic curve. Which would look something like this. So here, this is um, corresponds to an elliptic curve. If you draw a quick picture of it, it sort of looks something like this. Um, and you see, um, both of these are rather similar. So uh, you know, the integers kind of behaves rather like the ring of polynomials in one variable. They're, they're both Euclidean domains, and pretty much anything you can do with one has an analog for the other. And similarly, this ring here, you can think of as being sort of analogous to this ring here. You see, um, in each of them, you're, you're starting with this ring and adjoining the square root of something. In one case, you're adjoining the square root of minus five. In the other case, you're adjoining the square root of x cubed minus x. So, so there's a sort of close analogy between these two rings here. Um, so, uh, um, it's easier to understand these three conditions if you look at them geometrically. I mean, if you look at algebraically, these, these seem to be three completely random conditions you put on a ring, and it's not entirely clear why you should put them all together. Um, so if you look at some sort of geometric Dedekind domain, such as this one, let's look at what these three conditions mean. First of all, we have this condition that it's notarian. Well, in algebraic geometry, the notarian condition means roughly not weird. Um, so most of the examples of rings you come across, at least in basic algebraic geometry, are notarian. And rings that aren't notarian behave rather strangely in algebraic geometry, at least they used to. I mean, non-notarian rings are becoming more and more important in algebraic geometry, but um, I won't worry too much about that. What about the condition that non-zero primes are maximal? Well, geometrically, this corresponds to the dimension of the, um, your algebraic set being at most one. So you remember the dimension is the length of the longest possible chain of maximal ideas like this. And if every non-zero ideal is maximal, the biggest length you can possibly get is naught contained in some maximal ideal. So this is a chain of length one. So, so non-zero primes are maximal, just means dimension at most one. Next, we have the integrally closed condition. Well, um, geometrically, this is, corresponds to the condition being normal, and normal implies in particular that singularities have co-dimension at least two. It, it's slightly stronger than saying that singularities have co-dimension at least two, but that will do for the moment. Now, if the dimension is at most one and singularities have co-dimension at least two, then this just means everything is non-singular. So, um, so the condition about being integrally closed um, more or less says that the Dedekind domain is corresponding to something non-singular. So, so Dedekind domains correspond very closely to non-singular curves. Um, here you have to interpret the word curve in a fairly general sense because 
things like the integers don't quite correspond to a curve in the classical sense, but you can think of them as being almost a curve. The, the point is that they're, they're one-dimensional things that, that, that don't have singularities. So um, now let's look at this unique factorization from the geometric point of view. So here we have, let, 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 let's just take this elliptic curve k of x, y over y squared minus x cubed plus x, which looks a bit like this. Uh, I guess that should, shouldn't go off there. Um, and um, there's an obvious example of non-unique factorization because y squared is equal to x, x minus 1 times x plus 1. And here we have two completely different factorizations. So this you can either factor this as y squared or as x times x minus 1 times x plus 1. And now let's look at the zeros of all these. So the, the zeros of y look like this. So, 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 so here are the... Here are the points where y equals naught on the curve. Um, and the points where x equals 1 look like this. And the points where x equals 0 look like this. There's a double, double zero there. And the points where x equals minus 1, I guess that's barely visible. Um, let me use a different colour. So x equals minus 1 correspond to these two points here. Um, and now um, y squared equals x times x minus 1 times x plus 1 means if you take two copies of these orange points it's the same as taking the green points and the blue points and whatever this colour has ended up, some sort of pink I think. Um, and now we can find Ideal, the ideals of functions vanishing at the individual points. So um, the, the, the functions vanishing at this point here is just the ideal y, y plus 1. And similarly, the ideal y, x is just functions vanishing at this point, And the ideal y times x minus y, x minus 1 corresponds to this point here. And now you find the ideal y is equal to y, x plus 1 y x y x minus 1 which just says the zeros of y are this zero and this zero and this zero. Incidentally checking the product of these three ideals as y is not actually completely trivial. It's not obvious at first sight how you can get y in, in, uh, as an element of this product. Similarly x is equal to y x squared. x minus 1 is equal to y x minus 1 squared and x plus 1 is equal to y x plus 1 squared. So we find that the um, non-unique factorization y squared equals x x minus 1 x plus 1 just corresponds to um, this, ideal, this ideal squared being equal to this ideal times this ideal times this ideal which as you can see just says both sides it's just this squared and this squared and this squared. So we do indeed get unique factorization of ideals. You see that unique factorization of ideals has a very simple geometric meaning. It's basically just saying a, 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 a union of points with multiplicities can be written as a union of single points in, a, in, in a, an essentially unique way. Um, in fact, we can get the following dictionary between algebra and geometry for Dedekind domains. So for, in, for Dedekind domains, ideals correspond geometrically to things called divisors, which are formally sum over i of ni times pi, where pi is a point on your curve, and all but a finite number of the ni have to be zero, and these should be non-negative integers. Well, if, if I guess these correspond to positive divisors. Um, then prime ideals just correspond to points pi. Um, that's prime ideals that are non-zero, of course. And an element f of the ring correspond to the zeros of, um, sorry, corresponds to a function on the curve. 
and the map from an element to uh, the ideal generated by f just corresponds to taking a function f to the zeros of the function. Um, unique factorization is um, corresponds to the, basically the trivial geometric fact that um, any sum of points with multiplicities can be written as a the sum of points with multiplicities in some sense. You, I mean, you're just saying a divisor is a linear integral linear combination of points. That's, that, that's just the same as saying any ideal can be written as a product of, of prime ideals. Um, so, so the unique factorization conditions for Dedekind domains is very natural geometrically. Um, now I'm going to give some examples of things that are not quite Dedekind, dem Dedekind domains. So first of all, um, you remember there were three conditions. There had to be notarian, primes were maximal, and they had to be integrally closed. So we can drop each of these three conditions and see what happens. So first let's look at examples that are not notarian. And I'm going to give two examples. I'm going to give a sort of algebraic example and a geometric example. Um, so for the geometric example, you might take um, the ring of power series in one variable. Well, this is a Dedekind domain, and it's contained in the power series in, say, x to the half, which is contained in the power series in, say, x to the sixth, and so on. And you can keep going like this. And what you get is the um, Uh, ring of Puiser series, um, which are something like, you can think of them as being something like power series, except the exponents don't necessarily have to be integral. And um, this is certainly not Notarian because, for instance, we can have the ideal i, which is equal to x, x to the half, x to the sixth, and so on. So it's generated by all of these. And we notice, for example, that i squared is actually equal to i, so we certainly don't get any sort of unique factorization of ideals. You can do a similar thing algebraically. If you take the p-adic integers, you might um, add p to the half, p to the sixth, p to the 1 over 24, and so on, and you get something rather similar. Um, there are other examples of things that are almost but not quite um, Dedekind domains, for instance, the ring of holomorphic functions. Um, and this very nearly is a unique factorization domain because if you've got a function f, you can write it as a product of Weierstrass factors. So it's, it sort of has unique factorization, except that this product may have to be infinite. For instance, the Weierstrass factors might look like um, you might get things like 1 minus z over a1, but then you might have something like 1 minus z over a2 times x of z over a2, where Weierstrass discovered you, you, in order to get convergence, you have to put in various cleverly chosen fudge factors. Anyway, so, so holomorphic functions come pretty close to being a Dedekind domain, except they're not Notarian and only have unique factorization if you allow infinite products, which is, of course, not really an algebraic operation. Um, next example is something that is not integrally closed. And as before, I'll give an algebraic example and a geometric example. So the algebraic or arithmetic example is something like z of root minus 3. And this is not integrally closed because um, as the, 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 the element 1 plus root minus 3 over 2 is integral over this ring and not contained in it. And it doesn't have unique factorization of ideals. For example, 2 1 plus root minus 3 squared is equal to 2 times 2 1 plus root minus 3. So here we've got two different 
factorizations um, of an ideal into a product of prime ideals. Um, a, a corresponding geometric example might be something with a cusp. For example, we might take the ring of polynomials in two variables and quotient out by y squared minus x cubed. So this looks something like this. It's a curve. And as you see, it's got a singular point here, which corresponds to the fact that this ring isn't integrally closed. And let's check it's not integrally closed. Well, if we put t equals y over x, then we find we can identify this ring with k, with the ring of polynomials in t squared and t cubed, which is contained in um, the ring of polynomials in one variable. And you should think of this ring as being contained in its integral closure like this, corresponds to this ring being contained in its integral closure here. And again, you can see that the, the, the ideals don't behave terribly nicely here. For example, t squared t cubed squared is equal to t squared t cubed times the ideal t squared. And um, this funny factorization, we have a non-unique factorization, corresponds to this non-unique factorization. In both cases, we're sort of getting i squared equals i times j for two different ideals, i and j. So, so something is clearly going wrong. Um, so um, finally, we have some examples where non-zero primes need not be maximal. And again, we'll have an algebraic or arithmetic example and a geometric example. And you remember this condition said that the ring is sort of one dimensional in some sense. So all we need to do is to take something that's kind of two dimensional. And an arithmetic example of a two dimensional ring is just the ring of polynomials over z. And you notice the ideals of this can be really quite hairy. For example, we can have various sorts of ideals like 8, 4x, x squared and it's some sort of primer ideal, but it's not a product of prime ideals. And similarly, we could just take a ring of polynomials and two variables corresponding to the affine plane. And again, the ideals are complicated. For example, we can have ideals that look like x cubed, x squared, y, y squared. And, you know, you, you, you can't write all ideals as a product of prime ideals. What we get instead for both of these is the lasker noether theorem which says that every ideal is an intersection of primary ideals. And this is a little bit weaker than saying it's a product of prime ideals. I mean, primary ideals are more general than prime powers, and intersections are a little bit more complicated than taking products of ideals. Um, incidentally, you notice that both of these are, in fact, unique factorization domains. That even though then, even though you can't write ideals as products of prime ideals in a unique way, you can still write the elements as product of irreducible elements. Um, so um, the relation between Dedekind domains and unique factorization domains is neither of them are contained in the other. If you've got a principal ideal domain, then this is a unique factorization domain and a Dedekind domain. But here we've got some examples of unique factorization domains that are not Dedekind domains. And of course, we had examples of Dedekind domains like z root minus 5 that are not unique factorization domains. So in general, these are not the same. Um, incidentally, there is a common generalization of these, which are called Krull domains. Um, but I'm not going to talk about Kroll domains because Grothendieck strongly disapproved of Kroll domains. He said they were just a silly attempt to, to um, make something containing both unique factorization domains and Dedekind domains, even though unique factorization domains and Dedekind domains are really totally different ideas. So I'm not going to um, go against Grothendieck's opinion. Okay, the next lecture on Dedekind domains will be, uh, I'll be talking about equivalence of various conditions for something to be a, a Dedekind domain.